Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. In this presentation, we're going to talk about the fitting and the cementation of orthodontic bands onto first permanent molars. Now, orthodontic molar bands are stainless steel rings that are designed to fit tightly around first permanent molars in the maxillary and mandibular dental arches. Now, these bands serve to attach orthodontic appliances to the teeth, serve to provide a method of getting hold of the teeth to move them, either for moving teeth or to serve as anchorage teeth. First permanent molar bands are used in a variety of orthodontic appliances. The most common orthodontic appliances utilizing first molar bands that are used in interceptive orthodontics are the lingual wire appliance, shown here, the porter wire appliance, and the band and loop space maintainer. A variety of other appliances also utilize first molar bands through the bite elastics, face bows, and of course, full banded orthodontic appliancing. In this presentation, we're going to demonstrate the fitting and the cementation of first permanent molar bands. Also, we will demonstrate posterior tooth separation techniques. First, we're going to demonstrate the placement of posterior tooth separating devices most people have tight contacts mesially and distally on first permanent molars and require some type of separation before molar bands can be fitted or cemented into the mouth. The oldest type of separation device is the brass ligature wire, shown here. To place the brass ligature wire, you first bend a small curve into one end of a piece that's about two inches long. Use a 139 bird bee plier for this purpose. To place the separator in the mouth, you grasp with the pliers at the end of the bent portion that is the longest and bend down the excess wire along the long axis of the plier so that it doesn't injure the patient. And open up, please. To place this separator in the mouth, I'm going to place it on the mesial of the first permanent molar. You start on the buckle and loop this wire underneath the proximal contact point. And you can see it coming out on the lingual side of that molar contact point. When it has come out the lingual side, you grasp it with the pliers and pull it through a bit farther and bend it over the occlusal surface, the marginal ridge area. The two pieces of wire now are looped through the proximal. You grasp these two pieces here with a how plier. The how plier has two flat surfaces that oppose one another. and you twist with this how plier to tighten the brass ligature wire into the contact point. When the wire is tightened to the point where it won't wiggle up and down, when it's tight to pressure is applied superiorly and inferiorly, you know that it's tight enough and with a wire cutting plier you can cut off the excess. Be sure you leave a fairly long tail, enough of a tail on the bent wires to allow you to uh, grasp it and bend it over. Before you do that though, you should remove the bird edge by giving it one last twist with the how pliers. To bend this 
portion over, grasp it with the 139 plier, and bend the twisted portion gingerly. Bend it around so that the end of that twisted portion goes right into the proximal region. The reason we bend it down, of course, is to prevent irritation to the patient's cheek tissues while the separator is in place. And there is the placed brass separating ligature wire. Now, this technique of separating teeth works very well. It, it has some disadvantages in that it uh, can irritate the gingiva if it's left in place too long, although they can be left in place two or three months even if necessary. The teeth begin to separate though and the wire moves around then. It'll begin to move and with movement it can irritate the, the gingiva and the cheek tissues. The, the main advantage is though that it is an inexpensive uh, piece of brass separating wire and uh, can be uh, applied for a multitude of purposes for separation techniques. Now I'm going to remove this wire and demonstrate the second type of uh, separating technique that's used most frequently. To remove these wires, you simply untwist the portion. And very often it will break like that and gently remove it. The, the second type of separator that's commonly used clinically is called the TP separator. Now TP, capital T, capital P, is a brand name and they are a preformed wire separator. And it, what it amounts to is a, a very tiny little spring with a helix at one end and two free ends. Now the longer portion of the wire here is going to be placed occlusally. The shorter portion of the spring is going to be placed gingivally through the contact point. To place the TP separator, you grasp it with the 139 plier on the shorter leg of the spring and place it right over the contact point and with a downward pressure on the longer leg of the separator, it's slipped into place. Now, I wanted to show it halfway in. Maybe, maybe we can show it. You start by placing that curved portion like that on the marginal ridges and it flexes. You can see the flexing, the opening of the spring. When it is flexed open then, push lingually and it slides into place. It snaps through the contact point. There it is, halfway placed. The rounded portion of the longer arm of the spring is still contacting the marginal ridges with a little bit of finger pressure, I guess I'll have to use the pliers, we can push it farther into place and it snaps down in. There is the completely placed TP separator. This then, by closure of this little spring, applies a separating force to the two teeth, enough separation for the band metal to slide down into place. Now, these are very effective springs. That's the main advantage of these TP separation springs. They can irritate the gingiva a bit though because they are wire and uh, they can cause some injury if they're left a long period of time, but for a period of three, four, five, six weeks even, they can be left in place and serve very well. To remove a TP separator, you grasp the helix and simply flex it open and snap it out. The third type of separator, the one that is the best, is the latex elastic separator. These are manufactured by the Unitech company, orthodontic company, and several other orthodontic companies. They're 
very tiny little latex rings. And they are placed between the proximal contact points with a separating plier. The plier uh, is a reverse action type of instrument. Squeezing it opens the two points. To use this plier, the separation elastic is placed in the end, and it's simply placed down over the proximal contact point and with a very slow sawing motion back and forth, measy, buckly and lingually, it's snapped down into place. And the latex separator is placed then. These separating ligatures, elastics, can be removed by using a any explorer type instrument and just applying an occlusal force. If you don't have one of those separating pliers, you can place one of these A-elastics with two pieces of dental floss looped through the A-elastic like this. And by grasping the two pieces and pulling apart, stretching it like this, and sawing back and forth, you can place one of these separators, too, in the mouth. It snaps to place. Then you remove the two pieces of dental floss, and it's in the mouth then. Now, these are the best separators because they, they uh, will not greatly irritate the gingiva, even if left in place for a long period of time. They are the most comfortable for the patients also. And the third big advantage, though, is that they provide the fastest and the widest, that is, the most effective separation of contact points for banding purposes. The bands themselves come preformed in boxes of 20 or so different sizes. The, the bands are, are marked to designate whether they fit maxillary or mandibular arch teeth and also to designate whether they fit right or left side first permanent molars. Now, the bands are marked on the mesial with a numbering system. This is the Unitech company's band marking system, and there is on the mesial surface of this molar band RL36, right lower size 36. That is the meaning of that number and letter code. For the selection of a band from the band box, use a uh, cotton plier, tweezer, and always use a sterile technique. The bands are kept uh, relatively sterile in the box. You select a band and try it onto the model of the patient that you would have. Select a band that would appear to slide down over that first permanent molar if it was placed in the mouth. For trying on the band in the mouth, you first of all, using finger pressure, attempt to seat the band by simply pushing down on it. Now this band will not slide onto the tooth at all. It will not slide down even a little bit. It means that the band was selected too small. If that is the case, you go back to the band box and select a band of, say, one to two sizes larger. The first band we used was a size 36. We're going to now try a size 38 band. Again, with finger pressure, you try to slide the band down onto the tooth and in this case, the band slides on, and it slides way down 
into the gingiva even, too far down. And there's a big gaping gap between the buccal surface of the tooth and the band metal. To remove this band, you would have to use the band removing plier, which is a metal beak opposed by a plastic coated beak. The plastic coated end goes on the occlusal surface and you can grasp the band either on the cervical aspect of the band or by simply engaging some part of the buccal surface of that band and squeezing the plier and it will lift it off the tooth. This is the action of the band removing plier. So the size 38 band was too large. So we're going to go back and select another band. This time, let's try a size 36 and a half. It's done by the trial and error method. Again, by using finger pressure, you attempt to slide the band down on the tooth. This band goes down onto the tooth just enough so that it will stay put. It will not pop back off the tooth, but yet it doesn't go so far onto the tooth that it slides right down to the gingiva. This begins to look like a band that will fit the molar tooth. After you've placed it on with your finger, you can use a tongue blade and place, place the tongue blade on the occlusal surface of the band and using the pressure from your thumb, you can push down and try to seat the band a little farther onto that molar tooth. You can also, at this point, if you want, have the patient bite down. Would you bite down, please? That's good. Open on the tongue blade, and this will help push it down. The most effective way, though, of, of placing a band, fitting a band down in the tooth is with the band biting instrument. The band biting instrument is uh, an instrument with a triangular tip and a large plastic portion. The, the triangular tip is placed on the, the four corners of the bands, the mesial buckle, the, the mesial uh, lingual, the, the distal lingual, and the, the distal buccal corners of the bands. And using either pressure from your thumb, as I'm going to do here, of the other hand, to, to apply a little cervical force to that tooth. That's one way you can seat the band. The other way you can use the band biter is to have the patient bite down after you have engaged the occlusal edge of that band with the beak, with the end like that. Now just bite very gently. Fine, that's good, thanks. You have to drive on, drive down the band on the buccal aspect of the mandibular molar and on the lingual aspect of the maxillary molar. The, the buccal aspect of the mandibular molar is, has the large curvature, the large bulge surface. The lingual surface is, is, is uh, more vertical and the band slides right to place. You have seated the band then to a point where the band metal is just below the crest of the marginal ridge, mesially and distally, and it's just at the cervical end of the buccal and lingual groove, large mesobuccal groove on this first permanent molar. At this point, you can use an instrument called a Mershon band adapter. This instrument is, is a can be a very dangerous instrument. It's, it has to be used with great care. The tip is used to adapt the metal of the band to the molar tooth. To use this instrument, you grasp it with your entire palm. And you always make sure that, as many times as possible anyway, that this working end is directed upward occlusally, upward for a mandibular tooth. 
you place your other hand around this working end and with a wrist motion, moving only your wrist, not your fingertips, you can apply very carefully pressures to adapt the, the, the buccal surface and if sometimes the lingual surface of these molar bands. You should never use this instrument with a, a pencil grip, as I'm demonstrating here. Nor should you try to use the instrument by, by placing the tip on the edge of the band and then applying a lot of force with no guide fingers in place. We have a slide to demonstrate the, the, an injury that occurred in our clinic as a result of misuse of this, of this instrument. The, the instrument was directed gingerly and it slipped and, and it created a large, uh, a large injury in the, the, the depth of the vestibule of this patient's mouth all from misuse of this Mershon band adapter. So always keep the, the palm grip and some guide fingers in place and control the pressures that you apply. The, the band now has been fitted. The, the characteristics of, of a well-fitted band include uh, the, the, the mesial and distal aspects of the band being just the occlusal edge being just slightly cervical to the height of the marginal ridge, mesially and distally. On the, the buccal aspect, the band height is, is right at the, 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 the crest of the, of the groove and also on the, on the lingual aspect. On the uh, buccal aspect, you have to be sure that the band metal is not in a position to interfere with occlusion in centric occlusion or centric relation or in any excursion. Uh, ideally, the band metal should extend under the free gingival margin on the, in the buccal aspect. Here, the, the uh, gingiva has receded slightly and the, the band metal does not extend down far enough to go just under the free gingival margin. But in young children, it is possible. To, to extend this metal down underneath the free gingival margin. This gives the maximum caries prevention. The, the, the last characteristic of a well-fitted band is that it will not rock back and forth when alternately applied buccal and lingual forces are placed on the tooth. If you apply a buccal force and then a lingual force, buccal and lingual, the band will not rock back and forth. This means that it's well fitted onto that molar tooth. At this point, you remove the molar band with the band removing pliers and add any attachments, buccally or lingually, that you may want to add for the, the preparation of the orthodontic appliance that you're fabricating. To prepare the patient for cementation of the band, First, you place a sliva ejector in the mouth, and you place some, some cotton rolls in the vestibule, maxillary and mandibular. And for the cementation of a mandibular first molar band, you also place a cotton roll on the lingual aspect. Before you place these cotton rolls, it's a good idea to clean the tooth with rubber cup and prophylaxis paste. Any scaling that might be necessary, too, is a good idea. While you have the tooth isolated also, look and see if there is any proximal caries. You should ideally have bite wing films of any tooth that's going to be banded before you would even consider banding it. But when you have the tooth separated, you can see proximal caries, sometimes it doesn't show up on radiographs. After you have the tooth isolated, you then can begin to prepare the cement. For cementation of, of orthodontic bands, we use a lot of cement. We are going to mix enough cement to completely fill the molar band. For band cementation, we measure out seven or eight drops of liquid 
zinc phosphate cement, and you begin to mix small portions of the zinc phosphate cement, spatulating for 15 seconds, approximately, until the powder is completely wetted. This procedure goes on until you reach a consistency that is desired for cementation of orthodontic bands, and I'll show you that consistency when we reach that point. The consistency that you want for band cementation is beyond the primary consistency that's used for crown and bridge and operative purposes, but it is not yet to the point of, of cement base, the secondary consistency. It is somewhere between. It is more towards the cement base consistency than the primary consistency. After you've reached that range of band consist or, or of uh, cement consistency, you take the the band and completely fill it with this cement that you've mixed. Drive the cement against the inside surface of the band so that it's completely filled. You go back to the patient's mouth then, and you have had this tooth isolated the whole time, and with finger pressure, you plunger this band to place. You want to plunger it to place so that the cement oozes out the cervical aspect of that band as you go to push it down. This makes sure that there's a real good seal of the band metal to the tooth. Finger pressure will push it down quite a bit. You can then use the, the band biting instrument, applying pressure at the four corners of the band, buccally, lingually, mesial, distally, to to seat the band down into place. The tooth has been kept dry the whole time, isolated with cotton rolls. And because you've fitted the band so carefully before, you know exactly where it's going to seat during the cementation process. You have to drive down the band on the buccal aspect. The lingual aspect of mandibular molars will go to place fairly easily just with the buckle pressure that's applied. After it is seated to place, you can use then the Mershon band adapting instrument. Again, using a palm grip, guarding the end of the instrument with your two fingers, and very carefully adapt the band metal to the buckle surface of that molar tooth. After the band metal is adapted, you can take two cotton rolls and place them on the occlusal surface of the band and have the patient close down. Close down and allow that cement to completely harden before the excess is chipped off. When the cement is dried, you chip off the excess with a B scaler instrument. You remove all of the excess from all surfaces of the band. Be sure you clean very carefully down near the gingival aspect of the band to, to keep the gingival irritation as minimal as possible. Now, bands fit very well onto teeth, but occasionally there will be a very slight line of cement visible. There's not much of one on this band, but very, very slight line of cement can be seen between the band metal and the tooth, at least from my point of view. It's difficult to show on television. This is acceptable for a molar band cementation. If the band becomes uh, uncemented, to the point where the edge of this band is away from the tooth and it collects food, that is when the band needs to be removed, cleaned, and re-cemented. This is called washing out of cement. If you adapt the band well, though, during the initial cementation process, the washing out effect won't occur. 
Now, a well cemented molar band should protect a tooth, actually, from proximal caries and also from buccal and lingual caries. And if the cervical edge is below the free gingival margin, it will protect the entire buccal and lingual surface of the tooth. Now, there's always some periodontal irritation from any band that's, that's bound to occur, uh, just as with, with any foreign object placed in the mouth. However, if, if you have adapted the metal closely to the tooth, the, this, this irritation will be kept to, to, to the minimum. Now, bands can remain cemented in the mouth for, for two, three, four years, or even longer without a problem if you use the proper fitting and cementation techniques. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.